update on the beach nourishment project. Um, we conducted a 2017 uh, survey, uh, the entire town, and uh, we'll go through that, compare it to some older surveys from 2013, 2015, um, and then we had the 2017 survey to, to look at some volumes and some trends there. Uh, we'll take a look at some shoreline changes, um, both within the project and outside of the project. and. Um, We'll see what kind of kind of trends uh, we're seeing. So, just a reminder. Um, so this uh, the duck project was about 1.6 miles and about 1.3 million cubic yards. Um, there's uh, in two bar areas A and C, um, and uh, Great Lakes had set up three sublines um, from each of those sublines moving north and south throughout the project. Uh, the southern area was done by the Liberty out of that two to one ratio from bar area A. Uh, so that material was a little coarser and then the northern section was that finer material where they put 20% extra and we'll see um, that in the cross sections um, just through the equilibration. Um, some slight changes between those two. but um, So we'll just go over a project over overview. Uh, some photos, uh, construction sequence, um, just a reminder. And then we'll just look at, again, the equilibration, what we anticipated. Um, we'd see what we actually are seeing with those profiles, uh, get into those shoreline and volume changes. Um, then we have some, some bar area plots just showing where they dredged, kind of the difference there. Um, and then just open it up to questions. Uh, so here we have uh, some pre-project conditions, and I'll, I'll scroll through these, you know, rather quickly, but um, that was before any material was placed, uh, day three, pumping out. You can also see the, the dune that they've started to build um, there and just the difference um, size-wise from, from what was there before. Oh. Going too fast forward. Um, so, oh, this was a video, but just them pumping again on day th five, uh, day six, again, moving down the beach. Uh, day 20, we see those two other areas uh, farther to the north um, that they had set up with the two smaller dredges. Um, day before, uh, kind of tying it all in, and uh, project complete. Um, and so, here's another view of that. Uh, end of June, uh, just looking north to south. Um, that's the project. Um, the, the day was completed. And again, just to compare that to, to what was there uh, before the project. Uh, equilibration. Um, so we had this nice wide beach, and um, I'm sure you guys have seen these slides before, um, but they're just so important, and we stress this during the project. And um, as you'll see with the cross sections, um, you know, shocker, but you know, it ended up happening. You know, there's a lot of material moving offshore, there's a lot of sandbars building up. Um, and so, again, here are pre project conditions. So we build that beach, that template, um, that includes that equilibration, that also includes the advanced fill, which is your um, re nourishment interval, that background erosion losses that you anticipate. After five years, that advanced fill erodes, and then you just put that, that sacrificial fill back. Um, again, the, one of the real world examples we had looked at in the past um, construction template this is what was built. Uh, that material moved offshore. Um, and then again, you get that wave reduction um, from that. Um, and then this. Uh, We'd also taken a look at this. This is courtesy of the FRF, but you'll see from the northern end um, the duck project being built right there. And then just watch the waves, the, um, the refraction that, that sand's moving. Start Those sandbars are starting to form, and then there towards the end, I mean, you really see those sandbars uh, far offshore. And that's kind of the process that, that we had seen here. And so, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's as slow as it, uh, as I have it. But yeah, again, the, the project coming in and then over the next month or so, just those waves hitting it, the sand starting to move, starting to move, and then there, you know, we see those, those white areas farther off. And, Is uh, the white that's out in the water sand? Uh, where, the wave, uh, where the waves are hitting. Okay. Exactly. So, so it like a break okay. away. <laughs> And so now, um, and uh, Ken, it, it, it is gouging itself, though, down at the pier. Sure. Yeah. 
Okay. And we'll look at some volume and yeah, some shoreline trends. And <laughs> okay. They could have gotten saved. <laughs> and uh, I'll show that kind of the same way in a couple different ways. And here's one of them. Um, so that's, this is the same picture right after the project was completed. Uh, so June 29th. Uh, August 1st, we're, we're seeing that the, those waves, you know, breaking over a longer period out front, uh, but still pretty close to the beach. Uh, then we move to October 5th, um, now, now the waves again just breaking farther offshore. And then if you look at, at where it is now, uh, the next picture is from yesterday. And um, just again, seeing how much farther uh, those waves are breaking out there. Um, it's just, uh, and, and we'll look at one more, the, the cross sections and actually, you know, the surveys that we took um, that really show this um, and what happened to the sandbars. So, um, for those surveys, uh, we swim out and um, with a survey rod, get all the way out there. Um, and so, you know, and you know, a few of us were out here doing this, and it's it is pretty incredible. I mean, you know, you know it's going to happen, and um, but when you get out there, I mean, the the size of the sandbar, you know, actually swimming there and and, and walking up on it, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. So the amount of sand that that has moved out there, um, very noticeable. And like we said, I mean, those equilibration slides we've been showing you all along, um, you know, this is this is it right here for this project. So a couple things to notice. Uh, this is at Diane Street. Um, the first one uh, being uh, this accumulation on the berm. Uh, this is something we don't typically see, um, but some of that has to do with uh, those three storms um, that hit uh, in um, September, October, um, and just how much sand got moved around there. And so with the project not being fully equilibrated yet and those big storms coming in, it really pushed um, a lot of sand up onto the profile. Uh, whereas before, it, it might have been a, a more gradual process with the building of the sandbars and then the breaking of the waves. But you know, here the project was built and then we had those, those big waves coming through and really moving a lot of sand around. So, um, so yeah, uh, the, the northern end of the project um, or the majority of the northern end, um, the, the berm is around two to three feet higher than what it was constructed at, which is pretty interesting. Um, and let me backtrack too, the, uh, the green line is what was built immediately after construction. That's what the contractor was paid for. And then you have the red line, which is the December 2017 survey. December. December, yep, yep. And so the, the post-con survey was done when, when all four of the projects were completed. Uh, we went ahead and did the post-con survey. And then those two, um, the, the skinnier black line and the dotted one are just the before surveys. Um, and so you can see the difference. And so what we're looking at here is the difference really between the as-built green line and the red line. And so the immediately after construction portion, that green, that, that air, where that area is, uh, that arrow is pointing, a lot of that material, like we had talked about, moved offshore to build up that sandbar here. Um, and so, you know, something that we had always talked about is that standing, um, that blue line at zero is basically the water line. And so something we had always talked about is, you know, when it does equilibrate, you're gonna be standing on the beach and you're gonna looking out and you're gonna say, you know, half the beach is gone. And again, you know, we had always talked about how it's just migrating offshore, um, building up those sandbars. And this is one of the profiles and all, you know, every, every profile in the project looks identical to this. So it was pretty, pretty interesting to see. And, you know, again, not, not surprising. Um, uh, and then the other small thing that we noticed, and it's kind of hard to see here, but at the very top um, on this profile, you can kind of see the double peaks on the dune on the red line. And that, it, that's basically from the sand fencing, piling up so much sand um, and doing a great job there. And, the, you know, the town being proact proactive and installing that um, and just being able uh, to capture um, a lot of that sand. And, uh, yeah, just up here, this little that secondary kind of feature there is, is pretty cool. And, um, yeah, it's just sand trapping and planting and being proactive with everything. So, um, and so just to remind everyone, this is greatly exaggerated. Oh yeah, right. Absolutely, it's a uh, yeah, ten feet vertically to two hundred feet horizontally. So, uh, looking at 
Oh, and then again, the wave reduction. You know, in that example, it was a few hundred feet. Here, uh, you know, I mean, you're looking at 500 feet of, you know, that wave breaking farther off than it was before. And in those slides, um, kind of transitioning through the whole project, I mean, that really shows it, at how, how um, that, that white area or where the waves are breaking kept moving farther and farther offshore, so. Um, another example, uh, a little farther uh, south, Spindrift. Uh, this was the last station before the end of the project, so about 1,000 feet to the Army Corps. Um, and again, I mean, we're seeing the same thing um, here. The only difference is we don't have uh, the accumulation of that berm. Um, but outside of that, I mean, the sandbar, that, this one's raised, you know, three or four feet than, um, than, the, than it was in the pre-con survey, um, you know, larger, higher. And so again, just a lot of that sand moving offshore, and we see that just in every profile that, um, that, that's in there. And they'll all be in the post-con report and the duck monitoring report, but I at least, you know, wanted to, to show a few of them. Um, and then just the other thing I wanted to mention, um, so this is Kitty Hawk. Um, this is before those two major storms, uh, Maria and Jose, um, in uh, September. And this is the last of the project that was left to be completed, and there's about 5,000 feet. And uh, this may explain some of why um, we saw areas with a higher berm elevation and some, some without. But um, again, so that was a picture of September 15th, right before Jose and Maria. And we saw 12, 15 foot waves. We saw elevated um, storm surge, um, an additional two or three feet. So we had some, some big waves moving um, around. And, and I, I guess because this happened in Kitty Hawk after the Duck Project, I don't know if I ever showed these slides, but this is sand fencing that went in before those storms. Uh, this is the same sand fencing a few weeks later. Um, not wind driven, this, is, this was completely storm driven. Um, and again, and so in Kitty Hawk, what we're seeing is uh, up to four feet of extra or higher berm elevation. And it's, um, it, it's just a lot of sand being moved. And for this, I mean, this was in the middle of construction for them, so it was even more significant. Um, and then another picture I'd just like to show that contractor, uh, all his pipes got buried uh, after one of the storms. So they spent the day washing them out with a front end loader. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, you know, they hadn't really seen, you know, sand like that get moved around, I mean, just overnight. Um, and uh, yeah, and so looking at, this is uh, Luke Street in Kitty Hawk. Um, again, we can see that the green is at plus six. Um, and here, so constructed the six and all this extra material, you know, their berm's now at plus 10 in some areas. And where Luke Street is, is um, it had already been constructed. And so this is what, um, how it looked after. Again, the same sandbar here, they really didn't have a sandbar, so it's really, you know, a lot of material um, filled that up. The next cross section we're gonna look at, Kitty Hawk Road, is that area in the aerial that had not been constructed before the storms. So there's about 5,000 feet, and it, they all look, you know, very similar to this cross section where we see the shoreline changes, you know, a, a lot less than we are um, in other areas. And so this process of equilibration, you know, we had always talked about it, but, you know, I mean, with those storms, it does seem that that may have um, sped up the process. Um, and again, it was still going to happen and, and that, but just looking at Kitty Hawk and the, the one 5,000 foot section that had not been constructed and how all those cross sections look a little more like this, less of a sandbar um, so far, but um, a little more dry beach, but just something interesting. But um, I mean, in the end, of course, you know, they all equilibrate. Winter as well, sand tends to move off offshore. Summer months, it comes back. So we'll see that happen as well um, as we get into those calmer summer months um, too, so. Julian, is Luke Street north of Kitty Hawk Road? Um, it is. Okay, so it's it, it closer is. to the... It's 5,000 feet um, south of the Kitty Hawk. Um, yep, exactly. Okay. And then um, Kitty Hawk Road, so it's the 5,000. right? It, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah so. And what was even more interesting too, I cut one of the 
um, cross sections out, but there was another one. We had built um, about 5,000 feet south of Kitty Hawk Road, so when they built Kill Devil Hills, they went into the southern part of Kitty Hawk, about 5,000 feet, and those cross sections, because they had already been built, looked identical to Luke Street. Hmm. And so it was really, you know, anything that had been built, you know, tended to look um, like Luke Street, and then the one 5,000 foot area that had not, um, it looked similar to Kitty Hawk Road, so. Um, so we'll get into uh, some shoreline uh, in the stationing. Uh, we talk about these D monuments, but basically the northern end of Duck is D1, the southern end is D34, and um, I have some slides at the end too, if, uh, Correlating those to roads and anything, if you know, if anyone has any questions about specific areas. So, um, but shoreline change. Uh, we looked at this slide earlier, but uh, the way those those numbers come from, we look at the mean high water elevation, which is plus 1.2. That's where that arrow would be. You know, that arrow right there represents your before dredge versus your after dredge, it would just be those, uh, where those locations are, and that's your shoreline change, so. Um, and so what we have here is comparing the shorelines of uh, the pre-construction survey. So that survey is done along the entire project area a few months before, that lets us update the design. Uh, then we also have our BD surveys, which is immediately before they place material, and those are taken throughout construction. Uh, then you have AD, after dredge or immediately after construction, uh, and then post construction, which was that December 2017 survey. So what this really shows is uh, the, the immediate constructed area on average in Duck was about 240 feet uh, in width. So the dry beach was about 240 feet wide. Um, and what we have now, um, pre versus post con is about 120 feet. Uh, so uh, about half of that dry beach um, has gone and built those, those sandbars. And again, that's just representative of one point on a profile, and that's really why we, we look at volumes, and we'll take a look at those as well. Um, um, so kind of trying to uh, look at both the project and um, the town-wide. Yeah, uh, we took the 2017 survey, um, or not just the 2017, we basically set the 1996 survey as our baseline. And so anywhere, we took the, the mean high water elevation there and we compared it from year to year um, for every survey. And so generally, if you just step back and um, kind of look at all of the lines, besides what I have shaded, because obviously that includes the Beach Nourishment Project, um, we do see trends that um, are pretty consistent. Uh, certain areas um, have remained um, <clears throat> erosional and accretional, you know, over the long term. And then what I've highlighted is the uh, red-orangish area. Um, anything above that red line is better off or accretional since 1996. And of course, I mean, that large um, area there, um, you know, directly correlated with the project. But just looking at, you know, the, the purple areas, those, are be, those would be areas that are uh, worse off than compared to 1996. But uh, I mean, overall, you know, the trends are pretty consistent. Um, we've also done that for comparing it to 2011, a little more variability. Um, but again, I mean, this shows since 2011, um, whereas we had some, some larger swings compared to 1996. Here, I mean, a little more stable, um, you know, only a, a few areas that are, that are worse off than, than 2011. And um, yeah, and with the project, you know, obviously that's a, a large area of the town that... Um, Can you attach any kind of just markers to any of these spots? I mean, yeah. the, the nourishment area is obvious. Sure. Um, just rough, not exact. Sure, not sure. Exact. Well, so the, the Beachville um, goes from uh, Pelican Way down to the Army Corps. Yep. And so those are those two areas. Um, then we have our Army Corps station there. Um, and then just generally the, uh, the very, the part on the left is the Pine, Pine Island uh, um, duck uh, town line. Uh, then we have the same thing with Southern Shores at the bottom. Um, and then, uh, 
let's see. Um, but the purple south of the Army Corps Pier, yeah. how far does that go? Sandy um, Ridge, further? Like, um, sure, I'm just, uh, well here, let me, uh, let me just yeah. flip through something. Let me get to the back of these. I'll put these back there just in case. So we were looking at about, you said 25, 26, is that um, kind of so uh, June Road, Cook Drive. Oh, it goes that far. Okay. Bay Area. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. I wouldn't have thought it would have gone that far. <clears throat> Dune Road and Cook Drive were the first purple dip? Um, I'll pull this back up and we can take a look again. The bigger one? The bigger one that okay. starts like at the pier? Yes. Yeah. Oops. Let's see if I do it again, I'll... Uh, yeah, so um, where's Dune Road? That was 25 so that actually was closer to right there. Um, 22, 23. Um, I th That'd be like Schooner Ridge or something. Yeah, that's no, true. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the NC4 property. Oh, Ship's Ridge. Research Group property. It'll be so this one. Oh, just north of oh, the Research Group property. Oh, so. no, Schooner Ridge yeah. would make sense. Yeah, this area would be still within the. That's a core property. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all core property. The purple dip is the north, the southern part of the core property. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see that second arrow in there first, kind of an eye test. Uh, I was under the foot some erosion on that side. Um, so, oh, good point, sorry. We're looking at, um, in this one, so bef the one before, we were looking all the way back to 1996, and uh, we had 96, 2012, 2013, uh, 2015 and then two surveys in 2017 before the project and after and uh, and then this one where we're setting our 2011 conditions as our baseline uh, we have 2011 uh, and 12 13 15 and again 17 yes ma'am the, uh, the only surveys that we have are the December 2017 surveys Sure. Along that whole area. And sure. One area in there was probably eight feet drop off, just mm -hmm. for sure. Drop. Okay. After that storm in there. Sure. And um, we are um, planning on doing the next monitoring um, in sp the spring, April, May. And so that would be the next time to, to gather some additional data. Yes, ma'am. Hello. I don't completely understand all your drawings. I have to study them for Sure, a while. sure. I have on my laptop. I took a picture years ago of the beach going from Old Duck Beach to the Corps of Engineer Pier. It is beautiful. I have enjoyed the beach for many years. We built a house here in 1986. So we have seen a fair number of hurricanes and I think that pre uh, precedes some of your graphs even. Mm -hmm. We have had the most beautiful beach ever. We always congratulate ourselves on what a lovely beach we have when we say we've got the best beach on the beach. Um, when they started the beach nourishment, I said, okay. We came down, we volunteered. We've been planting beach grass with um, Sandy Cross here. But we didn't go to our own beach because when we weren't planting beach grass, it was either rainy or too cold. So we, we didn't go to our own beach until recently. And we walked down to the beach. The beach was gone. The water rolls in. The sand is always wet. At least it was while we were there. There's a sheer cliff, about eight feet, I think somebody said, that goes from the beach straight up. Mm -hmm. You can see layers in it, like an archeological dig. Mm -hmm. It's awful. That sheer cliff is going to erode every time the waves wash in because there's nothing to stop it anymore. Sure. We're south of the pier. We had a beautiful beach. And I think 
And I'm no scientist, but I think what happened was when they built, they nourished the beach, mm -hmm. those waves came in, they rolled down, and they scooped our sand away. Now, I don't think you can replenish it. I don't know what, what plans you have for anything. I don't really, it's just destroyed. Sure. It's been very upsetting. We can't even go down to the beach mm -hmm. because the sand in the cliffs is, you know, above. The sand dune is so dry, it just gives away. My husband has to go down with a rope so that I can get back up. He won't go down because he's had surgery on his knees. But this wasn't the case. And he helped build those steps going down to the beach years ago. Mm -hmm. The storms never washed them away. We've never lost our steps. And they're under the dune somewhere, sure. but there's a sheer drop to the ocean. Now, can you explain to me if the beach nourishment caused that or not? Everybody's telling me it was a storm, and I'm like, BS. Sure. We're calling BS, okay? Sure. sure. Because well, I've been there, I've gone to that beach about 50 years, I've had a house there about 40 years, yep. and this is the first time that this has happened. I've sure. seen winter storms come and go, I've seen some erosion. Yep. You know, Winter Beach replaces, replenishes itself. Sure. sure. But this is drastically different. Sure. And um, let me take a look at the volume um, changes, or let me kind of show some volume changes of um, just in general what we're seeing and also how we've seen some variation. And, um, and then uh, I'll come back to your question specifically. I don't think you could ask for your studies for the studies. Sure, I understand that. Sure, sure. Um, but speaking, so volume-wise, so that was the shoreline changes, um, and here we have um, our volume changes. And so again, shorelines looking at just one position on the profile, whereas volume, um, that would be accretion. Um, this area would be erosion and this area would also be a accretion. So we go through the profiles um, and calculate the volumes down to negative 24 feet um, just to give us a better idea. And so I know there's a lot um, going on here, but a uh, couple, um, so this, this, those red bars are 2013 and 2015. And what we were seeing there is that whole area being erosional during that time. And when the project started, you know, there was some talk, again, you know, that whole area is erosional, you know, what's going on. And so, what was that time frame again? Uh, 2013 to 2015. And th those three years are really the three years that we have survey data on that go out deep enough. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of LIDAR data, but, you know, if, if you're not going out to the full profile, similar to what we were showing with the construction profiles where a lot of it's moving offshore, you're not capturing that. So it's important to have profiles that go um, deep enough. And so, again, you see this whole area essentially says that one spot which happens to have the first, but that whole area would be an erosion of 2013 to 2015. Now, we look at 2015 to 2017, those green bars in that same area. Well, now we have essentially a reversal of the majority of that. Um, there's still some you know, small areas here, and then we look at the blue area, which is the combination, um, so 2013 to 2017. And so what we see, um, Specifically, I guess this area is, you know, long term. Um, it's relatively stable with uh, you know, mild erosion. But within that time frame, we see a lot of variability. I mean, look at these huge erosion trends that we're seeing on just about every profile from 2013 to 2015. Yet 2015 to 2017, outside of the project area, we see the reverse. And so we, we see this a lot here high wave energy areas, you know, you put that, you're, you're going to see that here. A couple significant other ones too, uh, D30, which is Scarborough Lane, and this was in the 2015 monitoring report. Um, there's also sand waves that, that go through these areas, and they'll cause huge bump outs on the shoreline, and then behind it, you'll get a huge erosional area because it's capturing that sand, and it's not, none of that sand is filling in behind it. And so, again, I mean, these are, these are big numbers here. In 2013 to 2015, we have this huge erosional trend. 
something that we wanted to watch. And then we come back and we see 2015 and 2017, that same area is largely accretional. But right behind it, 2013 to 15 was largely accretional, and now the last two years, it's reversed. So again, exactly, there's, there's movement of large sand waves um, that, and we see it in Kitty Hawk, we see it in Kill Devil Hills, and uh, we, we certainly see it here too. Um, looking 2015 to 2017, and obviously, just a point, so this is the project area here. Um, a lot of those are regional as we put material there, of course. Um, but the two areas, um, or three areas really, I pointed out are Scarborough Lane, again, you know, same way to identify that. Um, Pelican Way is uh, basically a thousand feet uh, north of the project. And again, a lot of variability. It, you know, 2013 to 2015, that's the only area north of the project that was increasing. And so now we're seeing it that it's kind of reverse trends and been erosional. Could that be a smaller sand wave? I mean, I mean it could be. And when we look at the four year period, it, it's very, it's stable overall. Um, and so, to, I guess going back to, to your question as well, it's, um, you know, we try to look at the long term trends, we try to analyze what's going on. But when we build projects, I mean, you're adding sand to the system. And what typically happens is you have those tapers on both sides, and that sand dissipates and, and basically fills and disperses across other projects, or across other areas. And similar to the equilibration, these aren't things that you know, we've seen in one project before, and you know, we just kind of assume it's going to happen again. I mean, this has been studied since the 50s. I mean, this is a very long. Um, scientific process and just the amount of projects our company has built in general. You build a project, you, you have tapers to try to minimize that diffusion, but knowing that a lot of that sand is going to migrate north and south, um, by adding sand to the system, you don't typically have negative effects of large erosion like that from adding sand to the beach. And while I, I mean, I, I certainly understand, you know, where you're coming from and, um, you know, the concern, um, you know, right now the best thing to do is to continue monitoring. And like we've seen with other areas where one year or two year period, we have a, a very large erosional trend, that next two year period, it's, it could be the complete opposite. So, you know, there are a lot of factors, sand waves, um, and it's possible that, you know, the, the beach and the way um, that the amount of sand that's moving, um, that or we know sand, there's a lot of sand moving around, but to think that by adding so much that we're now negatively affecting a lot of areas, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to say on such a short, short time period since the project's been constructed, but looking at the science, looking at projects that, that have built, built, been built in the past, not only through us, but anywhere, um, you know, the, the trend is that that sand diffuses north and south and you'll have accumulation there. Um, and so... I totally agree with what you're saying. Sure. That sand, it seems like it would cause a depletion somewhere Of course, else. yep. Of course, and that's something that the town's committed to monitoring townwide um, annually. Um, and so, as we get those surveys, you know, more and more, um, you know, it's it's really just updating and, and keeping an eye on it, and um, and uh, just actively managing um, the projects moving forward. Um, I tried to kind of touch on the areas um, that stood out. Um, if there's, you know, I know it's kind of hard to, to look at this graph and, and uh, you know, see exactly what's going on, but um, if, if you do have questions or even afterwards, if you want to ask me anything about a specific area, uh, feel free to. The, um, let me go back to the pier. Uh, to the what? To the area around the pier. Oh, sure. Um, they chose not to allow us to taper, yep. so we ended up with just a big bulge. Yep. And it looks like that as a result of that, it, there, the pier area is scoured out even more. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of that, that bulge 
equilibrating down to the pier. Sure. Is that what your data show? Um, sure, Shoreline-wise, um, so the two areas, Sandy Ridge, um, so that's 2015 to 2017, and that does, so that correlates to these two original areas right there. Um, so, so yes, the data does um, show that same thing. Um, whether that's sand uh, not migrating down there because there wasn't a smooth transition or that smooth taper down there. Um, I mean, that, that's certainly possible. It's so close. Uh, the difference between um, that and something um, 5,000 feet um, down, we typically don't see sand migrating um, that far. Um, but something like the, the Army Corps Pier, uh, I mean, that's certainly within the realm of um, influence uh, from the project. So um, there's, it's certainly a possibility that them not allowing, or the, the way the taper was built instead of what was originally configured um, could have um, an effect there. Are you talking about the north side of the pier or the south side of the pier? It's just hey, he was talking about, right I think you were talking about the north side of the north pier side. where we north mounded, the where all the north. sand was, was mounded because the taper wasn't allowed. They didn't want us to taper mm -hmm. because it would bury their Question. sensors that were there. Yeah. Is that correct? Uh, what was that? They didn't want us to Oh, yeah, correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't want any equipment um, on their property at all, so, yeah. yeah. But it looks like it scoured their property even more. I mean, Indian definitely built up quite a bit, you know, right after the project. It still looked like it had been building up, um, you know, through the summer and into November. Now, maybe some of the winter storms that you guys had after, after Christmas, maybe that that trend has shifted. But um, we still, I mean, typically we look at those FRF cameras pretty regularly, and it, I mean, I, I think that they've gained, they've gained a good chunk of sand in north of the pier. Um, since the project has gone in. Maybe some of the initial gains have, you know, cut back a little bit with some of the winter storms, but um, uh, I, I don't know if you've got some of those cross sections in that section, like 21, 22, maybe? Um, no, not on here. <coughs> okay. there, there were, originally, right after the project was done, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, weren't there um, comments that their equipment was getting buried quickly? Um, it did. At the pier. At the pier. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. Might have just been anecdotal. Had, actually. Yeah, but possibly. I um. I, I don't what remember actually. What do they say now? It, I haven't asked the question. <coughs> yeah. Don't want to ask. I just haven't. So. Um. And uh, yeah, I guess the the last part, just to touch on uh, the bar areas, um, just some pretty neat uh, slides. Uh, this is. Bar area C right off duck. Um, so that was uh, the finer grain material uh, where we had the um, Dodge and the Padre uh, dredging from. So this is before uh, they dredge. We see those ridges, those red, yellow areas, and I'll scroll, scroll back and forth one or two times. But um, And so that's afterwards. And so um, just showing them going in and uh, dredging off those uh, the, the high areas. And then we have a delta plot. Uh, showing the two, so the blue being the, uh, where they got the majority of the sand from, uh, the yellow area is a, a few feet um, that they took off the top. So, and Did they we, replenish themselves? Um, no, not um, not typically that deep. Um, Ken actually explained it uh, a little <laughs> this morning, actually, in Kitty Hawk. Um, I'm sure much better, but uh, with, uh, with these bar areas being in 50, 60 feet of water, um, you just don't get those large waves being able to move that much sand and at that depth. Um, so they typically, um, there'll be some infilling right after the project, but they typically don't um, infill back to what we see um, before the project. A lot, of, a lot of the borrow sites that we're using out here, it's not like we were on flat bottom and we were digging a pit. It was these mounds that we were shaving off. So, I mean, whatever created those, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago, it would, you know, take events like that over time. And like Julian said, in 50 feet of water, there's very few events where you're going to get waves big enough that there's movement of sand around in 50 feet of water. So, um, I mean, typically for offshore bar 
borrowers, you just don't you don't assume that those things are going to recharge themselves when you're working around inlets. Um, you know, you can you can work on renewable sources of sand, but not in the offshore. So when you move into a replenishment phase, then you have to find new borrow. Well, that that was going to be my next question. I just I just simply can't recall um, how much sand is left under in the current borrow areas. Uh, J C is finished. Yeah, yeah, we used there, it up. There, there's some left in C, but you know that's getting that into the corners and things like that. And so they, they pretty much, um, even during the project, kind of hinted that um, there, there really wasn't much left in C. Um, in A, which uh, right here. Uh, a is the one that's off Kill Kill the Hills. Hills. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that one yeah, started that with about 17 million cubic yards, um, and that's about uh, at 12, 12 and a half million cubic yards um, left. So, and then same thing with uh, we saw with Barrier C. This is before, um, after. This one's pretty neat. You can actually see some of the the, the paths that they took, the drag heads um, in there. Um, but again, same thing, those high ridges and afterwards, and uh, another delta plot. So <laughs> the blue being again where they took the major majority of the material from. Do you think that's an issue for our area because, you know, future projects and all the renourishment that we'll be looking at to, that we could actually have trouble finding the sand? Sure, long term, um, I mean, certainly um, just finding, and it's just finding new um, sand sources, but. Um, I mean, with the renourishment, we'd always talked about it being less material to renourish. So the idea is, um, you know, for renourishment, um, hopefully that can last a, a few cycles. That, that doesn't, that, that, that's not that long. Then you just need another 100 million years to get. <laughs> no, the, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management after Hurricane Sandy, they actually uh, invested quite a bit of money into looking at um, future offshore sand resources. And so they had funded something like a six million, five million, six million dollar study, and uh, our firm was awarded part of that. But they they started doing offshore sand reconnaissance work um, in federal waters, everywhere from you know down in in the middle of the state of Florida all the way up to New England, and uh, identified some you know some some new sources of sand that weren't there. I'd have to take a look to see exactly what was done in the northern part of North Carolina, uh, but there are still some 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 other one some of those shoals that are out there um, the, during the Kitty Hawk project there um, there were a couple of munitions that came up in part of the borrow area so I think over the next year we probably are going to want to take a look and reassess uh, you know how much usable material is in that borrow area uh, probably look at some of the you know some of the reconnaissance work that was done through that Boehm study and see if um, you know cost wise maybe there are some other other areas to investigate. Um, we will be able to watch uh, better how that sand that was used from borrow area C that was a little bit finer, it wasn't, you know, the optimal grain size, but watching how um, that sand performs on the beach, if it really makes that much of a difference. And, uh, you know, so if, if it plays out that, you know, that grain size would be suitable to, you know, continue to renourish the beaches up here, then that might open up some other, some other sources that, you know, we would have kind of discounted the first time around. So um, borrow areas are certainly something that we'll be talking about, you know, over the next couple of years as we're, you know, monitoring this, but thinking about that next project into the future. Um, I don't think it's a crisis because of the amount of sand that's left in that borrow area A, but, you know, time time seems to tick by pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, what, what seems like forever from now, 10 years from now, it, you know, it's not, it's not a long time. So. Thanks. Um, and just summarizing um, the the mean high water uh, trends that we're seeing, especially since 1996, have stayed uh, relatively consistent. Um, volume change analysis, again, you know, relatively stable um, over the long term, with or with, over those four years. Um, with a lot of variability between um, those uh, intervals. So again, just um, the more data, um, you know, we can just analyze those trends further and, and, uh, and just continue to monitor those. Um, 
along with monitoring the, the town uh, shoreline and then uh, just keep an eye on the sand fencing and the planting. I mean, we, we're seeing what a, what a great job that's doing at trapping sand um, and just continue to make sure that, that we're doing that to grow those dunes. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and open up to, to questions or any comments or. Julian, I have one, you probably can't answer this question. Maybe the town staff can, but back to the question that came out of the back. Sure. What are we seeing from the pier south to the line with from a standpoint of visually? I know in, in Tuckahoe, we've had quite a bit of erosion also. And Sandy, Merrick, you guys probably see it. Merrick and I have been out to the beach uh, easily three times since her uh, winter storm Grayson hit. And there's definitely pockets south of the pier, probably, um, I could say, Marlin Drive, Wampum Drive, um, Old Duck. Uh, tides in Tuckahoe got hit is especially hard, um, but then there's other areas that were a little more stable. Uh, surprisingly, Cook Drive and Bay Bear didn't see a whole lot of the scarping. Um, there was also areas north of the pier in um, the Sandling Resort area and some Palmer's Island areas. In fact, the slaughters were here earlier, and you know they had a, a decent, probably three or four foot escarpment. So. It was a pretty substantial storm, followed by several other uh, little nor'easters or high surf events. So, I mean, I honestly, I would attribute a lot of what we are seeing to that winter storm Grayson, because it was just a monster. And if you look at the graphics, the satellite imagery, it was an enormous storm. And um, it did carve out some places on the south side as well as the north side. Do you have anything to add, Merrick? No, I, I agree with Sandy as far as that goes. Um, there are certain areas that are being eroded a little bit more than others, but they're constantly shifting. I mean, we never know, as far as sand being pushed up by the wind, there's no consistent sand being pushed up by the wind either. So along with the ocean, it's just really inconsistent as to, to those erosional sections. And yeah, there is a little more erosion on the south side of the pier than there has been in years past. But I, there are a couple gauges that I use going down the beach and we haven't reached the lowest that I've seen in the last 20 years. Not yet, anyway. <clears throat> Would we as a town make any recommendations to those homeowners or homeowners associations with respect to fencing along those lines? I have been recommending to anyone that inquires to install sand fencing at the base of the escarpment as soon as possible. Right now we're still experiencing a fair amount of wind, um, so sand is blowing. We are seeing a little bit of buildup at the base of the escarpment. That may be partially just the escarpment sloughing off, but if you don't put the sand fencing there, it's going to keep blowing right on past. Uh, is there a risk with putting sand fencing into that point? Absolutely, because if we get a lunar high tide or we get another high surf event, it could take out that sand fencing. But in the off season, if you want to try and capture some sand or build back what was lost from these storms, that's probably your best option short of doing a beach push, which I'm not really a big fan of. We're not out of the storm season yet for the winter. Um, Thank you, Sandy. Would you assess that the project, based on the storms that have come through, has performed as you expected and will probably continue uh, if we have the same types of storms uh, through the future? Uh, sure. And uh, yeah, I mean, just looking at how um, or where that sand's been moving, uh, building up those sandbars, I mean, that that is what, oh, uh, just the way um, the sand has been moving, um, building up those sandbars, uh, equilibrating like we've talked about throughout the project. Um, I mean, that that is what we anticipated. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, but when, um, when we have our, the, during the winter months, when we have those higher storm events, a lot of that sand naturally, um, without beach nourishment uh, moves offshore as well just to protect the beach and build up a sandbar um, and so when we when we do see or when the summer months roll around we'd anticipate some of that material migrating back um, and uh, and that's when you see a, a wider beach and so that that even outside of beach nourishment is just your typical beach profile response um, summer versus winter months um, and so um, you know now it may seem that you know, the beach has equilibrated a lot, um, but what we'll see in the summer is some of that coming back as well. But in terms of just building those sandbars, where the you know sand moving around, um, it, it is what we expected to see. The reason I asked is, the reason I asked is because 
I hear the comments that, my, the beach is half of what it was when, you, when we put it in. Sure. But that is what our expectation was. A hundred percent, yep. Okay. And uh, those, uh, those kind of cartoonish slides is something I showed at every um, biweekly meeting, um, at not just here, but, you know, I, I think it was 15 of them or something like that. And so, you know, any town hall meeting, you know, those slides would go into every single one to really set those expectation, expectations ahead of time that, that we know that's going to happen. It happens with every beach um, because, you know, it's not just about protecting the dry beach. I mean, you need those sandbars to, to dissipate that wave energy for the longevity of the project. So it's, it's something we really tried to, to hammer home throughout the project, uh, before the project, and, and even after. So well, The reason I asked it is because I guess the beach went from 250 feet to half that. Yep. Now, what is the expectation of that other half? It, oh, sure, sure. But, and that's where... Um, well, what I mean is, but, supposedly, the equilibration phase is, is about done. Sure. So, so we would not expect that 100, 120 feet to become 60 feet in another correct. six months. Correct. Yes, that's correct. And so we saw that bulk right off the bat. And then again, with with those larger storms that we've seen, um, we did I, I kind of touched on how Kitty Hawk is parts of that haven't been as quick. And so we have seen that happen just quicker here. And um, again, it's uh, we'll, we'll we'll continue to see that that sand moving, you know, back and. Um, again, back, you know, every winter, summer, it's going to happen again. But you're right, we don't anticipate 60, 30 to go um, there. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it, it, we and we'll that. know a lot. Uh, we'll know a lot more, particularly the impact of these storms um, by June. For, you know, when they finish the the, sur the, the next profile surveys, um, we'll be able to to analyze that more because that's sort of post. Grayson and, and mm -hmm. everything else, and so um, it'll just be more data. This is what what we're seeing right now is, I guess it was what four or so months afterwards, exactly. yeah. um, and we had some, you know, we had some what three ma three major storms mm -hmm. during that period um, that caused that equilibration to occur quicker than the six to eighteen months, um, and now we'll know. How much of that sand sort of is basically still in the system? Exactly. So we'll be yeah. able to make a. So we'll be able to sort of. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll we'll start to be able to say, okay, is this still a five-year project or more, or is it, you know, is, is are the impacts of the storm pushing some sand out of the system, and so it's going to be, you know, it's not going to hold up that long, or that kind of thing is where we're, where we're, where this additional data will help us. Well, if I understood your data, with the sandbars being built out there, we've basically built the bars that you expected to build. We just happened to build them faster than maybe we expected it because of the storms. Yeah. When, when will you report back to us again, or do, will, we, will we see a report like this each time you do a profile study? So if you're doing one in the spring and you report back in, say, June, will you actually come here and talk like you're telling us now, or do we just hear it from Chris? Yes. Or, oh, yep. you'll come back. Yep, okay. yep, we'll come back and Great. discuss uh, the changes in the volume. I'm not, I'm not gonna try to explain <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please don't. Good. So. <laughs> we like these guys, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> that we want to use are to compare, because we, we created this design, we said that we need a certain design in place to provide that, that reduction to the storm vulnerability of those houses in that area. So we want to be thinking of, in terms of the volume that's supposed to be there to provide that protection, and is that volume still there? Because now that we've had, now that, we've had that equilibration, now we want to get into that more you know, long-term erosion rate of you know, several cubic yards a foot per year. Um, and we can we'll we'll measure that out all the way to the, that 24 foot contour. But now that you see the equilibration, I mean it's it's basically too early to tell as far as performance. We know that it, it equilibrated. That's kind of what it's supposed to do. But really, you know, in the in that April May survey, we'll have a little bit more information next year in April May when we've got you know almost two years of data. You know, then you'll be start, starting to see the trends because even one year in, you know, with the variability that Julian's showing on 
on some of those things where, you know, one pro profile is way up here. There's just a lot of variability. And until you see the project over a couple of years, then you know that you've dialed in, you know what the erosion rates are going to be, and, you know, are there areas that are eroding faster or slower. Um, so it, it, you know, we, we will continue to report back to you, but uh, as far as is the project performing as, as planned, I'd say yes, but, you know, the, the jury's certainly still out on something like this. I think the report, though, it's important in two ways. One, the project itself, but the whole town is probably even more important to us as to what the trends are over, the, over all of our six miles of each, because that's going to help determine where we go in the future. Right. Correct. One question statement. Um, right after we completed the, the project, um, we had some scarping, it was actually scarping north and south. Um, we were getting calls about the, the escarpment north, um, and you remember we went out there and, um, and looked at it and met with some, some property owners who were concerned, and, um, and at the time uh, there was discussion on essentially on each side of the project or on each side or, or on the ends of each project how much influence there actually sort of is um, in other for to other areas and and I know north um, which is where we were looking at um, most of the escarpment was out of the area where where you thought that it, there was influence from the project um, you know, obviously there's a concern that, that this project has caused something south. Um, and, and I think what you were trying to get at in your, your, in your comments earlier was that you've never seen that happen like that um, after building a project. Um, what is the, sort of what is the general um, influence of a project in, after it's built in a specific area? Um, yeah, that, that definitely depends on, you know, how long of a project it is, um, because the longer it is, um, the, it diffuses less um, because you have such a long project. And so here, this was comparatively a, a, a shorter project and a fatter project. And so we are going to see that material disperse um, over a longer distance than what we typically see. But um, I, I, I mean, we, we typically don't see material traveling more than 5,000 feet, I mean, on either side. Um, and that's why um, when we do those surveys or the postcon survey, we went 5,000 feet um, north and south of the project. Um, or that's t for the other towns. In this town, we went um, the whole town. Um, but um, I mean, typically, that's the most we'd anticipate to see. And so we recommend going 5,000. But usually, it's, it's less. It's much less. Um, and again, I mean, that's especially year one four or six months into it, um, definitely. I mean, that, that larger impact is 5,000 feet as well. I mean, that's over multiple years that we monitor that to see what's going on. So um, certainly this quickly, um, we, we don't see it more than a, a few thousand feet. Well, thank you, Julian. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thank you. Always good seeing you again. <laughs> Appreciate, Appreciate it. Appreciate it.